What's up everybody, Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today we're gonna talk about who I am. So a lot of you guys have been watching my videos for a while now and I'm sure many of you don't really have a good backstory on who I am. I know I've got it as a couple video topic comments in the past of I should make a video talking about who I am, what my history is, why you should even listen to me. And, uh, or why you shouldn't, I, I don't know. That's hopefully at the end of this video, you guys can make up your own mind. So I thought I'd get right into kind of what got me started in reptiles. What, what grew this passion to a point where it's become an obsession and a hobby and a business and everything in between. And I mean, if you look around me and you guys can't see what I'm seeing off camera, but I have hundreds of snakes and, and I've always had a, a ridiculous number of snakes. Um, it's just turned into an obsession, this passion that was sparked as I was a little kid uh, in, my, in my backyard. I would flip over rocks and I would go down to the train tracks and flip over any kinds of garbage and things like that, looking for snakes, obsessing over snakes and really any type of animal I could find. I remember I found my first praying mantis and absolutely lost my stuff. I was I kept that thing in a in a big one of those big water cooler bottles for a long time. I put some uh, some grass and things like that in it. I kept that thing alive. A few weeks went by and I finally just let it go. And I would do that a lot with all different types of snakes. And around where I live in New England, we would get the little brown snakes and then the the, the garter snakes. So I'd be flipping over rocks. I'd be putting them in my pocket, bringing them to school. I wouldn't wasn't paying attention in school because I was playing with the snake that the teacher didn't see. And uh, if the teacher ever came over, I'd just let the snake loose and all of a sudden there's a snake in the classroom. Nobody ever knew it was me. At least I didn't think they did. So that's kind of what got me started is just this natural fascination with uh, any type of living, living animal that was out there, whether it be a reptile, a mammal, the squirrel, whatever it was, I was always obsessed with animals. And then once I found reptiles, just something about this animal, I can't explain to you what it is, and I'm sure you guys can relate to the same type of passion, but I can't explain to you what it is about an animal like this, a snake, that gets me kind of so excited. And, um, and, and so that's kind of what sparked it. And I begged my parents for a snake. My parents, as we were younger, were divorced. And my father, I would go over to his house. And his house in the backyard, they, there was kind of like this cut through that went to this big open field. So I would go into this open field. There was this like asphalt rock pile. I'd be flipping over the rocks all the time, pulling out the little garter snakes and different things that I could catch and find. Fortunately, my parents were tolerant enough to give me little water bottles. I'd put the snakes in the water bottles. I'd keep them for a little bit and then let them go. So finally it became, I was a little bit older, maybe seven, six or seven, and I was really convincing my parents that I wanted to get a snake. Uh, they weren't happy about it. My mother definitely wasn't happy about it, but my father was a little bit more amenable to that fact. So my mother got me a book, or I, I, I had a couple books here, and uh, this right here was probably the first reptile book I ever got. And if you look at this book, it doesn't have a back cover anymore. It's, it's certainly well used. It's, this thing has been through the ringer. I got this book, I don't know, maybe I was five years old or so. And it has nothing to do really with keeping, but it was more the fascination of reptiles that I just kept going. And I was just obsessed with these things. I wouldn't put these books down. So my mother saw this kind of side project she thought of as, hey, if you read this book, if you show me you know how to care about these things and you're willing to put in the, the research and the time, maybe we'll get a snake. Little did she know, my father took her up on that offer and he ended up buying me a snake. But before that, he gave me this book. He said, I have to read this book front to back and he's going to quiz me on it. And he did. Uh, so I read this book front to back on ball pythons. And that was something that, uh, that first sparked my interest of, hey, I can keep these things. And, um, and I got to say, I mean, this book right here was like what sparked everything because it, it really showed everything about the husbandry and the breeding and the keeping. And I want to show you a couple pictures in here because these are the pictures that just, um, these are the pictures here. And hopefully this camera's going to pick up on it. Yeah, there it goes. So these are the pictures here that really got me interested in pythons and, and different things like that. You know, I just thought like this exanthic gene, this, this guy right here, these exanthic genes were just incredible. And this was before we even had morphs. The morphs in these books, we had a clown, a, uh, I don't know what the hell they're calling it, a black pastel, or they just called it an unusual pattern because they didn't even know what it was, a piebald and an albino. So these are obviously, these are ball pythons, 
And these pictures right here were what really piqued my interest. And this is just something that I, I never, never let go. I just kept going with it. I kept reading books. I got all different kinds of books over here. And this was obviously, you know, before we had the internet. I didn't have the internet when I first started keeping. I got, ended up getting my first reptile when I was about seven years old. My father ended up getting me a normal wild caught ball python from a pet store around us called PJ's Pets. Um, that ball python, it died maybe like a week after. I, I, it, I don't know if it was something that I did wrong, but it, it died shortly after that. And uh, it, it, the, we brought it back to the pet store and they said, oh yeah, it was wild caught, it happens often. So then what we finally ended up getting was a boa constrictor from the same pet store. They gave us a credit, we bought this boa constrictor. And from there, the passion just grew to this just crazy obsession that just kept going, kept growing to this ridiculous amount. And uh, I, I actually look back at these books quite a bit just to kind of remember that, hey, this is where it all started. And looking back in these books before I started the video, I want to show you this because these are phone numbers here. So check out that terrible handwriting. But I think more importantly in that is there's no area codes on these on these phone numbers. This was before we had to put in area code. There was no 1781, 617, 954. This was there were no area codes. They had few enough telephones out there that there were no area codes. Now obviously there's people who have been around much longer than that. But I did want to stress that, that, hey, I've been around for this for a long time. This is my handwriting as a little kid that I had the numbers to the vet, to Petco, to Pet Express, and PJ's Pets, and all these places that were important to me as a little kid. So kind of fast forwarding a few more years, I continued to, to become obsessed with reptiles. And again, because my parents were divorced, fortunately my father was very lenient, lenient and then my mother wasn't super happy, but she did appreciate that I was reading all these books. You know, I got, I got stacks of books that they would buy. And her whole deal was, hey, if I read a book, then I can show her that I know what I'm doing. She'll buy me a reptile or she'll let me have the reptile and then my father would would buy me the reptile or we would do kind of like I would work around I'd shovel and things like that save up money and then I'd go buy the reptile and and it really became just this passion that I couldn't kick until I got to about 12 or 13 years old or so and that's when I decided hey if I I was buying all these snakes from green tree pythons I was buying you know bearded dragons and different things like that whatever was available on the market whatever I saw and I I'd, I'd, obviously I'd research the heck out of everything this was again before there was a internet so everything that I was purchasing were from local pet shops or there was off of uh, reptile shows and things like that so before we went to these reptile shows, I'd read for two months, three months, every book I could get my hands on. I'd look at the pictures, I'd, I'd figure out snakes that I liked, things that sparked my interest, and then I'd research the heck out of it. And I'd say, all right, that one's not for me. Let me read more. I'd find another thing I like, and I just kept going. And this Burmese python here, this is a pearl Burmese python, which is a hypo albino. But a Burmese python in general, a normal Burmese python, was like my holy grail of snakes. I was sitting there at my friend's birthday party, and he had one of those kind of creature adventure places come in. And uh, I don't know what it was called at the time, but I remember being this little kid, a little fat kid. I was a pretty chubby kid. This little kid sitting there and had this massive Burmese python crawling across my lap. And something about the scale texture of a Burmese python, it, I'll, I'll never forget it sitting there with the snake crawling through my hands, touching the body of the snake, thinking that this thing is just the most incredible animal I've ever seen, ever, ever held. Um, it was just crazy. Then he pulled out spiders and cockroaches and all different stuff, and I just couldn't get enough. And that's really where it, it just turned to just no turning back at that point. So I was purchasing all these reptiles. My, my parents were now supportive of it, which I'm very lucky and fortunate for. And it, it just was this thing that grew. Fast forwarding a little bit further, I, as I started to, to mention is that if I buy a male and a female, maybe I can breed these things. And at the time there was no reptile industry. This was hobbyist breeders. Um, there, there was no big uh, market for them. There's no king snake morph market. Maybe there was fauna classified, which was pretty cool. And uh, the Bob Clark forums, which were awesome. I remember that was probably, I was about 15 or so just going crazy on the Bob Clark forums. But, um, 
all these cool things that were out there, I decided, hey, I could make some money. I could pay for feeders. That's what I was trying to trying to go at. I wanted to buy more snakes and I wanted to keep them healthy and buy newer caging and all this cool stuff without spending money out of my own pocket. And uh, that's kind of where, where it, uh, it continued to grow is I had a little bit of success. I bred things. I think I actually bred um, blood pythons. And I remember blood pythons at the time had a very, very bad reputation. They still kind of have a bad reputation, but I think we as keepers have become a little more amenable, specifically through captive breeding of these animals. We've calmed them down and we've, we've learned that they can calm down. They don't have this terrible reputation like they used to have. But I remember going to UPS, putting some water bottles that I warmed up in the microwave, putting them in the, in the package and shipping them two day shipping. Uh, I didn't know any better. I was like 13, 14 years old as I was doing this. My parents thought it was a great idea. You know, they didn't really research the snakes like I did, um, but they just let me research and I would ship them to places like from Massachusetts to New Jersey. So they weren't long trips, but they were certainly, I can't believe some of the things that I used to do and how far we've come to have things like ship your reptiles or Reptile Express, being able to ship reptiles across, uh, across the United States and even import and export out of the country. So I would just read everything that I could on breeding now. So now breeding became an obsession of me. Um, I wanted to figure out how to breed these things. I thought this was so cool. There was no market to make money. There was no PayPal and things like that. It was just, I wanted to see these snakes. I wanted to breed them, watch the babies come out. I wanted to see the eggs. I wanted to do the whole process and, and learn and, and make tons of mistakes that I'm not proud of, but I made a ton. And from that experience of making all these mistakes, reading everything I could in books, because again, the internet wasn't around, uh, I finally figured out how to breed things. So fast forwarding a little bit further, I was maybe 16, 17 years old and I decided to really get heavily into boa constrictors. Those were one thing that I, I bred, but I was never super successful consistently. It was more just luck than anything else. I would put a couple things together. Um, and at the same time, it was ball pythons. So when I was about, I don't know, early 2000s or so, maybe like 16 years old, that's when, or 15 or so, ball pythons were absolutely on fire. That's when the morphs like, um, like I just showed you, those were out of date at this point in the 2000s and you had piebalds and ball pythons and different stuff uh, or, and, and albinos that were now becoming more, more affordable. And I remember thinking the ball python, first time I saw that, the albino ball python, I was obsessed with. Um, I just promise I didn't have much, enough money to buy it. These things were going for $10,000, $10, dollars at the time. And being a 15 year old kid, there's no way in hell that my parents were going to spend $5,000 on a ball python that there's a good chance I was going to kill it based on my track record of some of these other things with ball pythons. Although these were captive bred. So now the whole industry and the whole market's evolving in kind of, I'm in the middle of this evolving with it. We're getting better care. We're getting better knowledge. The internet's popping up. We have other like-minded keepers and breeders who are all helping us learn better ways to keep these things, ways to keep them healthy. Hey, African soft fur. Nobody really thought about African soft fur rodents to feed a wild-caught ball python. They did, but good luck finding them. So all of this just continued to grow into this, again, this obsession. When I was 18 years old or so, I really started to hone in on boa constrictors and get out of ball pythons, mainly because I saw ball pythons I was passionate about them, I liked them, but I didn't like to breed them. Once you start breeding the ball python, in my opinion, it just took all the passion out of it. For a while, you know, there was this, this obsession for them, and that did last a little bit longer, but I got wrapped up into this, uh, I can make a lot of money with it. I started going to people saying, hey, can I borrow money from you? Because if I buy this $2,000 snake, I can buy a $2,000 male, I can buy 10 females, I can breed it to those 10 females, and we're gonna make a whole lot of money. So it transitioned away from this hobby, this passion, more into, I can make money with this, this is a business. And that right there was probably the biggest mistake that I ever made, was become obsessed with this as a business. And um, about four or five years after that, after a lot of failing, because I was hyper-focused on breeding and growing this as a business, these snakes became dollar values to me. Um, that was kind of the downfall of where I said, hey, I need to change my whole thought process on this. I had babies, I couldn't sell them. Uh, I had babies, I didn't know how to take care of them because I had too many. And, uh, and that's really where I learned a lot, a lot of hard lessons at that point. Things were sick. So I ended up 
uh, getting things healthy, selling off a lot of my collection of ball pythons, and completely diverting all my energy and focus into bow constrictors, which seemed to really be a passion of mine that I never kicked. This was one of those things that boas always fascinated me, different types of boas, rainbow boas, and all this stuff, but I never kicked that passion of boa constrictors, so I decided, let me go full force ahead with this. Once I got these, now I was breeding for a while, maybe 8 to 10 years at this point. I'm like 22, 23 years old at that point. And I continued to hone in what, I can breed boas, but how do I do it uh, predictably? And I was reading all this stuff online, and it wasn't working. It was the most frustrating experience ever because I'm reading all this stuff. I know I'm doing things right. I'm saying, yeah, this guy said on, on October 15th, I need to drop my temperature. So I drop my temperatures and I have to slow the feeding and I have to change my lights. Then uh, Valentine's Day is my last chance to make any snakes. So that's the last chance to put my snakes together. So Valentine's Day, I'd put them all together. I'd pull them apart and I had varied success. It wasn't until a little bit later on, maybe like again, 23, 24, where I finally said the hell with it, I'm gonna do what I know needs to be done. I've read a lot of books, I've done a ton of research, I've spoken to a lot of people, and I'm gonna breed them because I know how to breed them. And everything I'm reading is not the right way to do it. And these people might be lucky with it, maybe they're just not lucky, maybe they just have quantities and they're getting lucky in that sense, but they, it, it, I didn't have confidence in what they were telling me because I was trying the exact same thing, and I'm thinking, these guys are not telling me what they're really doing. So I'm gonna make my own way of doing this. And that's what I'm trying to portray to you guys in this videos, uh, or in these videos, is all the mistakes that I've made, all these different things that I've learned over the years of, of making mistakes, keeping things, being successful. Uh, the accomplishments were, were certainly amazing, but the failures are where I learned so much on is, uh, I started taking this little journal and I'd started writing down things that I would do uh, so I could look back year to year and say, hey, this worked, this didn't, this worked, that didn't. And then I finally put all these pieces together that worked, thinking that, let me just go for it. And that was the most successful breeding year I ever had. And so this was, again, maybe 10 years of me breeding, screwing things up, being uh, having success, but not being predictable, not being, man, the snake's getting heavy, uh, not being predictable. I can't say I'm going to breed, I'm going to purchase these two snakes and they're going to breed. I'm going to purchase these two snakes, keep my fingers crossed and hope things work out. And that's where I was going. So I finally really honed it in on what worked and what didn't. And, um, and that's when it really took off. And I said, Hey, I'm doing this as a passionate hobby now, I'm not doing this as a business. There's obviously a business component. I can't keep 500 snakes. Uh, my overhead's $30,000, $40,000 with my electric bill and feeding and, and all this stuff. So I can't spend $30,000, $40,000 a year unless I'm making some kind of an income. And that's really when I just decided to start Jason's Exotic Reptiles, is I needed to do something that was going to support myself, that was going to be a, uh, a company and wasn't just this guy, Jason, has some snakes. And that's what I did. So fast forwarding to now, I'm 32, almost 33 years old. I've been doing this for about 25 years, 26 years. And um, that's where, where I am. I, I'm still passionate about these animals. It's something I've never kicked. And, and, um, and, and I, I, I try to tell you guys the things that I've made mistakes on. I try to go on Facebook and Instagram and, and respond to comments. And I see so much bad information out there that I learned my, my lesson on. It's people are reading books. They're reading the same things that I was reading. They're making the same mistakes that I made. And I'm trying to tell you guys that this is, although this guy's putting it out, I almost guarantee you that's not what he's doing. Because if you do that, you're not going to be successful. A lot of these people don't want you to be successful. If I tell you everything I do, you are going to do it and you're going to make babies and now you're my competition. But I don't care because there's enough room for everybody to grow and there's nothing more frustrating to, than being unsuccessful. So again, you, you, I, it started with, the, with this just natural interest in reptiles, grew to this passion, to an obsession, and that's kind of, I think I'm still stuck at the obsession phase because I just can't stop with reptiles. Every time I try to downsize, I downsize and then, then I'll redirect and I'll grow. So that's, um, that's kind of where I am. So hopefully this video helped you guys get into a little bit more context of who I am, what my history is and backstory, gives you a little bit more confidence in the information I'm telling you. I want you all to succeed just like I wanted to succeed when I was younger. And uh, that's really what I'm trying to do in this channel is, is decipher all this bad information, give you guys good information, but at the same time, 
uh, it takes takes years of research. You know, these are the books. I have more below it. Um, you have to one have a passion for this, and then two have the willingness to learn, to do things for yourself, to go online, to read books, to read scientific journals, to go on Facebook and read what they have to say, and decipher the information yourself. Pick and choose what works for you and what doesn't, and um, and and at the same time, again, listen to people who have learned from their mistakes and who are going to be honest about it. So many people, so many big breeders, they tell you that this is the way to do it. And I'm sitting there saying, I know that's not what you do because I watched you do it. But they're, they're purposely trying to redirect you so that you're not successful. They do not want competition. So that's, that's again, like what I'm trying to portray to you guys is I'm trying to give you this information. If you take it, fantastic. If you don't, that's fine too. But I can guarantee you, if you take a lot of this information and you listen to it, you're going to be successful with keeping, breeding, uh, raising, whatever you want to do, you're going to be successful with reptiles, specifically boa constrictors, because that's where I specialize in. And uh, if, if, again, continue to watch these videos, you're going to get a lot of good information that I'm telling you that uh, I hope you're listening to and I hope you're following because, uh, again, I've learned from a lot of mistakes and I don't want you guys to make them as well. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys. I hope it gave you some insight onto who I am, my backstory. We're going to cut it here. And I appreciate you guys watching, subscribing, following, and sharing these videos. Thanks, guys.